Hello, this is Jim Schaefer, executive producer and host of Rip Rap, the academic book television program. My guest today is Bill Ayers. We'll talk about his book, Public Enemy, Confessions of an American Dissident. Welcome to Rip Rap. Thanks, Jim, very much for having me. This is an enjoyable book. I really like reading it. And that's the difference. Although Rip Rap's not a news program, it's hard not to ignore what's going on right now with the budget process and the country shut down and yeah. now we're coming near to the the uh, debt ceiling and the, and the issue of the Tea Party which I don't understand I mean in a way I do but fundamentally I don't understand how any group of people could be so centered on whatever their particular ideology is that they're willing to sacrifice the whole country for that and I just throw that out to you because I know you probably have deeper and well you know I'm not sure if I have anything deeper to say about it I think it's a, an outrage what's going on and I think the so-called Tea Party is you know a very loosely affiliated group of uh, disgruntled folks with a lot of grievances you know and and you can't really define Tea Party ideology exactly but these characters in Congress um, that's that's a different group, but this group is manipulated and run by big money. Um, one of the things I think that happens with all these social movements is the ones that are kind of uh, germinated by <coughs> big money, big money loses control of them and they have a life of their own. I have a section in the book called Talking with the Tea Party because what I've discovered is that well, I get picketed wherever I speak. I was at Gettysburg College last week, picketed. Elgin Community College the week before, picketed and all during the, the, the last eight or 10 years. And a couple of stories I tell in there about when the Tea Party came to picket me, and we ended up having a lot of agreement. Um, depends on, of course, who the Tea Party people are. I had a wonderful encounter in Georgia with a group of Hell's Angels who called themselves Tea Party Patriots. But after they heard me speak, the head of the group said, I agree with almost everything you said, but I'm worried that you're a big government guy. And I said, worry no more. I'm not a big government guy. I'm worried you're a big government guy. And he said, me? I'm a small government guy. I said, okay, let's eliminate the Pentagon. And he said, not the Pentagon. So I said, okay, now let's figure out who's the big government guy here. These are slogans we throw around, tax and spend liberal, big government person. Everybody loves their own big government. So you hear these folks in this health care debate saying, I love the Affordable Care Act, but I hate Obamacare. It's the same Thing, but the kind of propagandizing of it and the kind of, you know, dumbing down of our understanding of policy and politics at all. What I ended up with the Sells Angel guy in a long discussion about was there's no government in history that doesn't primarily tax and spend. That's what they do. That's what governments do. The question is, tax who, how much, and spend on what? I want to tax the rich and spend on education, health care, guarantees of income, transportation, you know, access, openness, you know, capacity to move around. Those are my issues. A lot of other people would like to tax the poor and build surveillance, prisons, military. I don't want any of that. I want to abolish the prisons, close every foreign military base, shutter the Pentagon. That's my program. Then I'd have a lot of money for my issues. But these are debates that you have in a democracy. Unfortunately, we don't have those debates, honestly, um, in, a, in a kind of evidence, fact-based kind of way. We instead throw slogans at each other that don't illuminate anything. I think I remember when the Tea Party began on the national scene, which it was corporations would send people to these supposed demonstrations. You know, yeah. they're completely uh, phony deals. Absolutely. And the Koch brothers are major funders of this thing. The Koch brothers are, you know, are the people who are um, making the most out of it. But but the other thing I would say about the Tea Party is they have a, they have an impulse uh, among the mass of whatever it is. Um, there's an impulse that I think is right, which is kind of an anarchist impulse or a, an impulse that fears government surveillance and so on. They also have a kind of paranoid wing, and they also have a very racist wing. I mean, I think this intransigence about Obamacare, you know, and again, speaking of contradictions, people will say, I'm against Obamacare, keep your hands off my Medicare. 
Well, Medicare. You know, what is socialist medicine? I mean, well, my slogan during the whole healthcare debate was Medicare for all. If it's good enough for me, I'm 60, almost 69 years old. I want my Medicare, but I don't see why you shouldn't have it just because you're 40. I mean, why shouldn't you have Medicare? Or te teenagers shouldn't have it. Of course they should have it. So I think healthcare is a fundamental universal human right, like the right to an education. I want it funded, and I want single payer and all of that. So Medicare for all. But I think that, that people get kind of twisted and manipulated, and you see this fight going on in Congress now, and you think back to the days when the city council was so opposed to Harold Washington in Chicago, and there was no rationale or rational way to understand it, except that Harold was black. And they couldn't bear the idea of a black mayor. I feel some of these guys, they just can't get over to hear Mitch McConnell say in his second year, my goal is to make sure that Obama's a one-term president. That's it. There is no other goal. There's no policy goal. There's no political goal. I hate Obama, is what they say. And it's nuts. It's nuts and it's racist. As I've watched the Obama administration, you know, go through this experience, I really have... I don't know if the expression would be right to say feel sorry for him. I think he suffered a lot for trying to promote these different policies. Though we may disagree about how far they should go, but even a decent thing, I mean, there's been a vilification That's that is, you know, a really awful kind of thing. And, and you wish that the country could back to some kind of semblance of a true dialogue rather than this ad hominem vilification yeah, kind agree. of a process. Well, I agree, and I, and I feel it very much in my own, you know, the, the kind of things that I've gone up against around these cancellations of my talks and so on. It's very much ad hominem. I mean, it's not, there's not a rational conversation going on about what I really believe and what I think ought to happen. If there were a rational conversation going on, even though my politics and my ideas are radical, are, you know, um, attempts to go to the root and, and and imagine a society that's more peaceful, more just, more joyful, more um, more free. Um, I actually think on issue after issue that if I frame the issue properly and correctly, I'm in a majority in this country. But I think it's very hard to get a framing that's honest in the kind of crazy, quick, soundbite kind of debates that we have. I also think it's interesting that whatever you <coughs> see President Obama suffering in whatever um, the first four years were for him, and I'm sure they were gruesome and brutal, but then most of us think, who would go for a job like that? Oh, no. uh, like the Onion headline after he was first elected uh, was something like, uh, a black guy gets the worst job in America, you know, yeah, hello. Uh, but, but I think in spite of all that, Obama has enormous support, and he got reelected, um, you know, handily over a, a candidate who was well-funded and, and well-placed and had the backings of power. And thought he ought to be elected and just because he had the money to do it. Exactly, and still somehow. And Karl Rove couldn't believe it. I mean, you know, the, all of them were stunned because it was unbelievable because they convinced themselves in their parallel universe that he was, you know, an outsider and an outlier and couldn't possibly do it twice. The, the, the trick couldn't be run twice. And there he was, elected overwhelmingly. So, you know, it's a, it's an interesting and bizarre world out there. It seems as though it, it, you hear the media commentators talking about it to a certain extent, but the country's changed. It isn't what it was before, you know, in terms of the composition of the people. Exactly. You know, it's there's different ethnic groups now who are growing a lot, right. and it's just changing. And I think that's. Well, and a lot of the, a lot of that's, for example, why the queer debate was over a few years ago, because demographically it was over. And we are a different country, and, and those who long for um, a country of white power and white supremacy and, you know, um, uh, corporations running things, uh, they are a little paranoid and freaked out right now. And so you th see things like in North Carolina, the Supreme Court strips the Voting Rights Act, and immediately the, the state legislature in North Carolina passes four laws that are designed to do nothing except exclude the very people who you're describing as the new America. 
The new Americans are not welcome in North Carolina. No, you know, poor black people, no poor people, no working people, no immigrants, no Mexicans. Yeah, that's what they're fighting. They're fighting for a vision of America that in some sense never was. Well, one of the questions I had is why did you give this title to the book? Well, my title actually, I wanted to call the book Palling Around because Sarah Palin in the 2008 campaign, early in the campaign, was trying to make this point very vividly about that candidate Barack Obama had some very shady friends and she was bringing up Jeremiah Wright and Rashid Khalidi and, and she was bringing up me and I was the character who was called the unrepentant domestic terrorist. And she said at a rally, um, you know, you and I, she said to her audience, believe that America is the greatest force for good in the world. But here's a man who thinks so poorly of our country that he pals around with terrorists and the crowd leaps into chanting, kill him, kill him. And I couldn't tell which of us they wanted to kill, <laughs> me or Obama or both. Um, so I thought the title, Palling Around, was great. My editor didn't like it because she felt that um, it was uh, um, it was too, too dated and Sarah Palin had already disappeared from the scene. I don't think that's quite right, but I took her point. She persuaded me that we ought to call it Public Enemy. It's an ironic title. It harkens to Ibsen's Enemy of the People. Um, to uh, a sense that, you know, of, of irony that, that somebody who's made into this caricature of a public enemy is, um, there's always more to it. And then the subtitle, Confessions of an American Dissident, my editor wanted to call it Memoirs, and I felt like that was too lofty. <laughs> yeah, that was, <laughs> that was too lofty. And, uh, and I wanted to, since there, there's been great pressure on me to confess, I thought, well, this is the best I can do as a confession. Um, it's not really a confession, it's not really an apology, but it's got aspects of both. And, and mainly it's an attempt to say, being, you know, of all the things, you can't live to be my age and not have lots of regrets, but of my many regrets, one of them is not opposing the Vietnam with more with every uh, fiber of my being or being a radical. I don't regret it, I still am a radical. And I think that throughout history, it's the radicals we remember. It's Malcolm X and Martin Luther King and Ella Baker and Jane Addams and Eugene Debs. These are the people we remember, and for a reason, because they weren't happily going along with the status quo, happily going along with the consensus. They were saying, no, there's another way, and I want to be part of that. And I think there's this tendency with the modern media to put these tags on people because they can understand that, but they can't really dig into it and right. understand the person. Yeah, I think that's right, and I also think it's a, it's, it is the modern media, but it's also a very human quality. We tend to stereotype, we tend to you know, reduce, because it's easier. And if you look at, again, back to education, which is where I spend my life, you know, the toxic habit of labeling kids by their deficits is not new, it's old, um, but it's, it's common. And, I think we have to resist it. I think it's very human, but I think it's also human to break out of it, to say, when you're the one being labeled, when I'm the one, when somebody says, oh, you're the guy with the tattoos, or uh, you know, you're, the, you know, you're the professor, or you're Malik's father, I always want to say, yes, but so much more. You know, I, because nobody wants to be pinned to the board like a butterfly. We are always more. And no matter, as old as I am, I still think of myself as a work in progress, somebody who's got to get up tomorrow and do other things in order to fulfill my life. I think that's the human condition. So I think we should fight against being labeled ourselves or labeling others. And so, you know, I want to be more than, I want to be not only a work in progress, living in history, but I want to be um, allowed to be complicated and contradictory. And I'm, I want to be like Walt Whitman. Do I contradict myself? very well. I can obtain multitudes, right? And uh, that's what I think every human being should be allowed. <coughs> One of my own students just today, as we were getting done with class, asked me about my core beliefs. And I said, well, how long do you have? Exactly. <laughs> you know, it really, it really took me back because she was looking for some kind of label or something right. that she could pin her understanding of who I am because 
I'm not, you know, that easily identifiable. Right, and, and, and I think that can be a great strength. I think that it's, uh, you know, uh, uh, the assumption that we know somebody by, you know, he's a Christian or he's a liberal or he's gay or he's conservative, none of that really says it all, and we ought to insist there's always more. Um, you know, we should be left kind of to wonder and to, uh, and to change. And I think that's what, uh, that's part of what I'm trying to do with this kind of stereotyping of, of myself. So now I'd like to go to the beginning of the book. Sure, why not? Where we were, you're talking about the spring of 2008. And I thought that was a really difficult uh, scene where, you know, the, the, it was the, you had the student get together and you're watching the debate and you get vilified, you know. And, and I thought, it, it's several different things that operate there. One is, you know, whether you seek it or not, you have a certain degree of celebrity, and it, it, it can intrude into your personal reality, uninvited, right. even unwanted. Right. Well, the opening scene is, um, it's interesting because I, I have my students over to my house often, and these were my graduate students who were, writing their dissertations, their theses, and we had a, uh, a potluck, and it was coming to an end, and uh, somebody turned on the TV. I, didn't, I wasn't watching the debate, but somebody turned it on, and everybody gathered, and it was Hillary Clinton and Obama near the end of the primaries. And uh, George Stephanopoulos asked about his relationship with Jeremiah Wright, and then he pressed him, and he said, on this general theme of patriotism, um, what about your relationship with uh, William Ayers, uh, who, you know, has said he wasn't sorry for, you know, these events that took place during the Vietnam War, and the bombing of the Capitol, and so on. And um, when he said that, my students, many of them just fell on the floor. They were so stunned to hear this. And one student looked up at me and said, my God, that guy has the same name as you. And the other, another student said, that's because it is him, you know. but. In a way, why should she know that that part of my history? I, it wasn't something I was advertising in class. And, and the odd thing was it felt like these kids had all known me very well 10 minutes before, and now suddenly I was a stranger, you know? And I felt that way myself. I felt a little bit displaced. So yes, it was an odd moment to be thrust into the national spotlight and have our little living room gathering suddenly take on this huge meaning, and my students couldn't have been kinder. They were offering to get me tea and kind of stroking my arm and <laughs> worrying about me. But the greatest thing that happened was my next door neighbor at the office, a professor, um, uh, had, had been a, is a Democratic Party activist, and she had been campaigning for Hillary through the whole primary, and she would stop in my office and say, it's Hillary's turn. Obama can have another turn, and I'd say, "Gee, Irma, I'm glad I'm not a, I'm not a, a Democrat because I don't have to worry about this stuff." And um, she would say, "Oh, darn, you know." She'd go off, but then eventually it got really serious in her house household, and she told me that her husband, of many years, was for Obama, and that they got so tense between them that they were that he was sent to sleep on the couch. And then after this moment, after this moment, when I became thrown into this. I flew to California, so I was away from my email for an agonizingly long 15 hours. And um, when I opened it finally, I had, I had three emails from my colleague. The first saying, I'm so sorry about what happened to you. I immediately wrote to the Hillary campaign and asked them to clarify, and I sent them your Vita. And then she wrote to Howard Dean, and went on and on like this. And the last email was, um, and she kept threatening, I'm not going to give any more money, I'm not going to campaign for Hillary if you don't apologize immediately and clarify that this guy is a great guy, meaning me. And the last email was, um, uh, I hope you're okay. Uh, John is coming back, come back into the bedroom. And I thought, well, you know, a small price to pay for marital bliss. But that was uh, one, of the, one of the weird things that happened during that whole thing. And that's tough. I mean, when it intrudes on you, uninvited, yeah. you know, in, in the middle of your professional duties, right. um, and I, I, but I thought that was fascinating, 
and you said that uh, Bill Iris, who had been quiet and still fermenting on a dusty shelf in an unused laboratory for decades, was abruptly plucked from a jar of brine. <laughs> yeah, well, that's somewhat how it felt. And, and I go on, I think, in that space to say that the Weather Underground was resurrected also, and it was breathed, you know, taken out of its amber and life breathed into it. And it had never been more threatening or dangerous or vital as it was suddenly in 2008. Um, crazy, really. Um, who could have predicted? But I think it served a pur they thought it served a purpose. The odd thing is that Hillary Clinton ran this whole thing uh, to, to oppose Obama. She tried to demonize him through his friends. She tried to guilt by association. She tried to say, sure, he's charismatic and brilliant, but what do we really know about him? She tried to spread the fear. It didn't work for Hillary Clinton. And then McCain Palin picked it up, you know, and didn't change a word, and they used the same campaign. So now when people say, um, can I take a picture of you, with you, I always say, uh, are you running for president? Because it helped Obama, maybe it'll help you. You know, because it, it turned out that it didn't work. It was a, it was a stupid strategy, and yet uh, it had, you know, consequences for those of us who were kind of caught in the, in the crossfire of it. I feel like, oh my gosh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> what is exactly. this? And one of the things, of course, that you know, but it's hard to realize until you're in it, is that a presidential campaign like this has a, um, not only a life of its own, but it has a, a, a wattage in terms of celebrity and star power that's so much bigger than anything else you've ever known that it, that it uh, um, just being a little side story on it makes you, thrust you into a kind of notoriety that you had no idea. Well, with the media right? press, yeah. Even an innocent comment like saying hello yeah. is translated into all kinds of nefarious meetings that Absolutely. have nothing to do with anything. Absolutely. But it, you know, but it did mean that for a long time, and even now to some extent, I can't go through an airport without, you know, um, being, you know, noticed. And, and that airport could be in Spain or Greece as well as in Chicago. So it's weird. Very weird. So there is a public to the public enemy part. Absolutely, but but I must say I, I take it all kind of with a big grain of salt. I I learned a long, long time ago not to you know believe what what either the critics or the or the celebrants say about you. I mean, you have to just live your life and go forward with a certain amount of purposefulness and modesty and and recognition that you're just who you are, doing the best you can. You know. I thought, it was, I, I thought it was interesting that you had the institutional support. I mean, there weren't any board of trustees meetings and humping and clumping with, oh, well, you know, we don't really know who that guy is. Well, what's interesting, I mean, I was, <clears throat> you know, I, I got my doctorate when I was 43 years old. Um, so I was old to get, to become a professor. And when I interviewed, everywhere I interviewed, Somebody asked me about my past. Somebody recognized and, and asked me about the years of the Vietnam War and the student movement. But at that point, 1987, people were more than willing to forget about it and to leave it behind. I found myself at the age of 43, a brand new professor at the University of Illinois at Chicago. A few years later, when I went up for tenure, I got tenure. The way people get tenure, which is publishing in a, in a research one university, publishing, doing research, and teaching, and that's what I did. And then I got full professor, and then I was made a distinguished professor, but it was all based on what the university core value is, which is, you know, the notion that you are judged by your peers and you move along. So I did it exactly the way anybody would do it. I was older than most people in my kind of cohort, but I, I wrote a lot, I published a lot, and I was um, eager to speak out about issues in education and public schooling. Um, then comes 9-11, and then comes the 2008 campaign, and it becomes a very complicated, different situation for me and for the institution. I have to say, the University of Illinois at Chicago, especially Stanley Fish, who was the dean of, um, who was the dean of liberal arts college and, and responsible for keeping me at UIC, and who's a mildly conservative guy, I don't know if you know Stanley, but conservative guy. 
But Stanley couldn't have been more brilliant and more forceful in standing up for the core principle of academic freedom, freedom of speech, uh, freedom of association, freedom of political belief. And he stood by me um, the most ferociously of anyone. Uh, and then, as you know from reading the book, there were a lot of institutions that crumbled in the face of people objecting to my speaking at their institution. Or, and it wasn't just conservatives or reactionaries, it was good liberals who uh, couldn't bear the idea of taking the pressure of uh, a few threats from a couple of nutcases if they allowed me to speak. That goes on to this day, um, as recently as last week in Gettysburg College. You know, they, they got a lot of phone calls and a lot of threats. Oh, the interesting thing, two weeks ago at Elgin Community College in, outside Chicago, they got a lot of emails. They were stunned to get a lot of emails complaining about my speaking there. And then they noticed that overwhelmingly these complaints were complaining about public money being spent to bring me to speak were from Broward County, Florida. And so what the <laughs> hell does Broward County, Florida have to do with Elgin Community College? Well, that's kind of what has been going on. This kind of demonization is a national campaign and it's uh, run by a few guys with internet addresses as far as I can tell. And there's the target on the front of the book, you there know. Is. That there is. There is. You must but, feel like to a certain well, extent. Well, in a way, that's kind of what happened. Um, I, again, I didn't take it all that seriously. I still don't. I, when I speak at colleges and they get these threats and they ask me, do I want enhanced security, I always say no. If I get to the podium, I'll be fine and I can handle myself there. Um, I don't need a police presence to get me there. It's a free country. I can say what I want. And, uh, what well, I, I have to say that these days in higher education, that's a pretty courageous thing to do is well, to speak you know, and demand I, I guess, the academic except, freedom. I, I guess, except that I, I, it's like this. When I moved to New York City, um, my wife and I moved to New York City. We had a couple of little kids. And in those days, people didn't go into Central Park because Central Park was a terrifying uh, place. This was in the, what was it, the early 70s, I guess, or mid-70s. Um, over time, over the next few years that I lived there, and I was a runner, I would run in Central Park. And over time, because more and more people ran in Central Park, Central Park became a non-scary place, right? Because people were there. If you desert and you run away, well then, yeah, you've, you've abandoned the public space to the scary people. In Chicago, I ride my bike from the south side to the, my office in the Loop every, uh, every day. And I ride right through the neighborhoods and people say, ooh, how can you do that? Because I insist I want to live in a world where I can ride my bike through the south side of Chicago. And if I stop doing it, then I've conceded that space and I don't want to do it. I still think that's courageous. Thank you. Well, thank you. We've completed the interview and I thank you for being on Rip Rap. My pleasure, Tim. Thanks so much for having me.